Well, good morning. Good morning. Those hay papers back there are kind of like about those little kids are skinny armed and starving and everything. And now they're healthy and they're being educated and good things are happening. Uh, God is good and worship. Just continue to support me. That one little girl, I called Barry. I said, I found this little girl I want to bring home. She says, Don't you dare bring the little girl home. <laughs> And I said, well, I can't because she has a mother. Well, I heard her mother, they were from this little bird called Hench. And it, they had their school in just a fax thing. It just had a roof over it. That's where the church met also. And uh, they uh, came in for that. But I gave them some shoes that I'd been able to get together. You are special. Gave me some and some other people that donated. And I gave them some shoes. And now she's a senior in high school and 20 years old and just beautiful. So just keep up the good work. Well, you know, last week I told you I had such a bad week. Well, this week I had a good week and a bad week. <laughs> the good week was I remembered to go to my class luncheon on time. And, you know, <laughs> last week I went a week early. There went a minute. But then I really had a good time. I, they gave our granddaughter and her family a, a time at the Gosa, Colorado for a vacation. So Tuesday, I went to lunch on time. Then Tuesday night, I get this call from this little boy. Remember, I told you the little boy that had the heart problem, but when well, he's up there with his folks, Grandpa, they call me Grandpa because their grandpa they call Cowboy. So I'm Grandpa and my great grandkids and my grandkids. Grandpa, we talk back, we talk back. I said, What? I said, Barry, what's he saying? He said, He said, We talk back, we talk back. Well, they're riding in the Bogosa. They saw a bear <laughs> in the creek. Trying to catch a fish. <laughs> and so that just made for a real good story. But then the week went downhill because I played cards with Dick Friday night and he won. <laughs> so, uh, that's that's not that's not always a good deal for that Dick because he, he kind of brags a little bit about what he did happen. Well, this is the fifth lesson in this series of lessons that the elders have asked us to cover. It's called Making Disciples. Rediscovering the Acts 2 Church. Well, what was so great about the Acts 2 Church? Well, let me read you what it says here about it. It says, The those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, they distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were saved. Well, it was a growing church. People were happy. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They were feared for God. They knew God loved them, but they were still fearful of them. They saw signs that the apostles done. But they were not only doing this on Sunday. What it says? They met when? Day by day. Every day. And they were hospitable. And they praised God. The first lesson in this series was the one about renewal and revolution, how we want the church to be <laughs> renewed, like the Acts 2 church. The second lesson was paganism, theological liberalism, calcified traditionalism. And then Larry taught one on rooted in the gospel, a biblical perspective on the good news of Jesus, life, death, and resurrection. And last week, was supposed to be grounded in the word and called back to biblical literacy and appeal to let scripture shape our thoughts, words, and actions. Well, we're getting out of sequence a little bit this week because of the vacation and everything. This week's lesson was supposed to be on the Holy Spirit. No. Yeah, and next week, Larry Miller's going to have one on prayer. It, we're a little bit out of sequence. And I was supposed to have this one three weeks now. But we're going to do it this way because of vacations and everything. But
We're trying to discover the single mission of the church. And one of those, one of those single missions is to make disciples. Let's go to Matthew. What does it say in Matthew? I was raised in the Baptist church, you've heard me say. The verse I heard the most was John 3 16. But in, this, in the Church of Christ, this is one we hear very frequently. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and I am with you always to the close of age. Boy, that sounds simple, doesn't it? That sounds simple. Making disciples. Well, what is a disciple? What does disciple the word disciple means follower. a follower. A, a disciple is someone who literally follows someone in the hope of eventually becoming like they are. What's a Christian disciple? It's a believer who follows Christ. And what's the point where they are imitating Christ more closely than they were the day before? But when we say making disciples, what does that mean? It means more than just converting them. It means that there's another stage of this. And I think we have a perfect example of that. You know, we learn in a lot of different ways. We learn by reading. We learn by touching. We learn by taste. We learn by smell. And we learn by example. And I think that Jesus gives us an extraordinary example of what it means to make disciples. <clears throat> he tells us what we need to do to make disciples. I'm going to give you a little, read you a little story now, which you see how <coughs> you tell me how this relates to this. It says Jesus spent most of his time making disciples. This is a story that a guy named Jim Collins. Imagine for a moment that you go to a cafeteria where you work and see an aide sitting on a table. This is a little surprising because it seems to be out of place. Besides, it's a large and speculating, nobody seems to own it. It sits there day after day, people are going until you no longer notice it. And then one day, out of the clear blue, an eaglet burst forth from the aide. Suddenly, the aid gets everyone's attention. People scream, it's a miracle. The New York Times comes and does a special on it. A transforms itself into an eagle. Forbes magazine talks about how much money you can make on this A transformation. Some loud, annoying minister preaches a sermon on the amazing miracle. But here's the truth. For 36 days, a radical transformation was occurring inside the egg. Unobservable to anyone passing by, a fully formed eagle was incubating on the inside, developing a, developing a powerful presence waiting to burst forth. And amazing one day, the eagles burst forth fully formed and soon rises up to soar like an eagle. Okay, see the Acts 2 church. Why do they have 3,000 baptisms one day? Not because they had the best praise service, the most ministries, or the slickest marketing campaign. They burst forth onto the world stage because Jesus has spent three years making 12 disciples, incubating them in the love of God, the truth, and the mission. On the outside, not much is perceptible. In fact, the disciples seem rarely to get it on the outside, but on the inside, a powerful transformation was occurring because Jesus was personally crafting his disciples. And when Acts 2 rolled around, the eight broke and the disciples broke, broke forth. And the church has soared ever since. If we want to be like the Acts 2 church, we have to make disciples of people. We have, they have to be disciples. And that is, that, why not oh, it's in this part. That is so important, but how do we do it? How did Jesus deal with his 12 disciples? I mean, these are people that 
They weren't geniuses, were they? They weren't swapping the boner. What did he do? He spent time with them. And in fact, he not only spent time with them, he lived with them. He did all these wonderful things with them, teaching them, and like it says here, they didn't get it. And guess what? After the three years, what else happened? He came back and what else? What happened for 40 days? He spent time with them again, right? <coughs> 40 days. He spent more time with them, even after he'd spent these three years with them, getting them ready for what was going to take place. And when did that happen? It happened when the power came. And what was the power that came? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them. So if we're going to disciple people, we need to make sure we take the time spend it with them to help develop them to that point. Well, I've got so far ahead of myself in summary. I've completely skipped one page here. I want to talk about last week, but the lesson I didn't get to finish, and then we'll come back to the story. Thank you. Hold on that thought, though. <clears throat> Remember last week we talked about culture norms? And how our culture is changing. One thing that I didn't get to mention that was right up, kind of on top of my list, and I, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, was another culture norm that seems to be acceptable today is that of lying. Think about it. Lying is prevalent today. We have an ex-president said he won. We have a president who said the Georgia polls are going to close at five o'clock in the new law. We have a person in Russia saying they're not causing any problems. Lying seems to be more acceptable today than it's been in a long, long time. What happened to you when you were a kid growing up and you told a lie? Whipping. You got it. I got the RB award. <laughs> That's called the red button. My dad would take that paddle and get after me big time. He could not stand people that lie. But we just kind of accept today as something that's acceptable. On a lot of, even the Hallmark movies, they have people lying in them. That's, that's, a, that's a sin. That's awful. Why is lying so important? It's trust. It's trust. And it's important. It's important to my parents. It's important to you. But it's more important to God. God says, thou shalt not lie. So that's another culture norm that we need to be very, very careful of. Because, yes. In my experience, that if a person tells a lie enough times, they believe it to be the truth. Absolutely. 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 When I was working, I had a guy that was going to become a district sales manager for the insurance company I worked and we were in training he was in training and everybody said boy this guy is going to be the best district sales manager all states had a long 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 time he's got what it takes while he's in training i knew that he was running around on his life so when it came time there were three of us what we call field sales managers but it came time for us to pick who we wanted as be our first choice for take a district sales bank position. I didn't shoot him. And my boss said, Why didn't you shoot Ike? He's going to be incredible. He's going to be good. I said, I don't want him. I said, If he'll lie to his wife, he'll lie to me. And if I can't trust him, I don't need that person to work for him. 
you didn't want to be born, you couldn't trust me. that money would, or anything. We have to be able to trust people. And we have to get this point across to our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids because it's becoming quite acceptable for they just to do it. So that's another one of the norms that from yes last week that I, I forgot to talk about. So now we're trying to get back on track about this being a disciple. Larry. Yes. Uh, Revelation tells us that the that liars will have a place in hell. Well, that's another good reason not to lie, then, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> I think that qualifies right there. I think that qualifies that right there. Well. What happened to these people that Jesus was working with, the 12 disciples? <clears throat> he taught them. Like I said, he lived with them. He knew their families. How do we do that today? I was talking the other day with Kate, and we were talking about what Jesus really did here was he was mentoring one day. And that's the term we use today, mentoring. The church, our church here, at one time had a program for mentoring. Mentoring. I do not know if it still exists or not. Ken Risley called me one day and asked me to mentor a young man. I will tell you, it was very pressure packed. A mentor, a young man. He was having trouble with his wife. Uh, he was a second marriage for uh, his wife. Had a daughter. She didn't like church here. When you're mentoring somebody, you have to make sure you try to put yourself in their footsteps and try to take them very slowly to the next point to get them to grow and accept what is right. He was very condemning because he didn't want to go to church every time with him, or she didn't want to, uh, the, like I said, the daughter didn't like the youth group, and there were other influences like softball and things like that. When I spoke, I said, take your time. Be loving to them. Work with them. If she has a softball game on Sunday, go to the early morning service, or go to the Sunday night service. Don't be so critical of what they're what they're doing. I don't like the idea of baseball games or softball games being on Sunday. When our kids are growing up, that didn't happen. They didn't even happen on Wednesday night. But now it's around the clock on Sunday. And so but I prayed and prayed about that. Because just like you could affect a person's life forever, eternity. By what you tell these people when you're mentoring. Jesus was mentoring these 12 men. Was he successful with all of them? Nope. Guess what? I wasn't successful with this guy, mentoring. Some ways I was. If I were talking about mentoring to go to this church, no. But he and his wife and daughter, the last I heard, were going to another church of Christ and very happy there. That was a successful part of it, successful part. But mentoring is something that Jesus was a master at. He took the time to be with these people. And was he always nice and nice to them? No. He told them the truth about what they needed to do. And I would tell you, we have to continue to work toward this all the time. We have to continue to look for opportunities to work with people and to mentor them and to tell them about Jesus and eventually make to get them disciples. We want them to be disciples, but we want to get them disciples, which means they are very involved. It's just like in Corinthians, it talks about the carnal walk and the spiritual <laughs> walk. Paul talks to people, calls people brothers that are on the carnal walk. But he wants them to go to the next step. 
the spiritual walk, which just means really, really getting involved. Uh, and we have to. Like the scripture says, oh, you, you just plant the seed, somebody else does the watering and all that. So you proud. That's right. I was at the bank uh, last Friday. And I was talking to a young fellow there. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something now that I don't know the answer to. And I don't know how we get to this point. But it's something we all need to think about. She said, I said, what are you going to do this weekend? She said, oh, it's my birthday. I said, your birthday? She said, yeah, I'll be 24. I said, well, what are you going to do? Oh, she says, we're going to celebrate for it. She said, what are you doing this weekend? I said, well, I'm teaching a Bible class Sunday morning, and we'll celebrate the power. She said, um, where do you go to church? I said, I go to the Church of Christ down on 9th and 5. She says, oh, I've been there. Those people are so nice. I said, well, why were you there? She says, I was part of their grief share program. And she says, you know, latest time was just incredible. She helped me so much get through this. I said, <clears throat> you go to church there now? She said, oh, no, I haven't been back. <laughs> this is the part that I struggle with. How do we get to take programs to be missions when we're dealing with people? How do we do that? Here she, we have, we have an excellent, she thinks excellent of us, thinks we're nice and everything. Thanks we do things right. She appreciated us. But somehow we didn't connect to get her to come to the church service. She didn't go. Yes, ma'am. Don't think Jeanette's finished with her yet, though. Oh, is that right? Oh, I'm sure they do. Don't but think Jeanette is finished. I'm not being critical of yeah. Jeanette. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I mean, that work is a very, but it have, we have a lot of opportunities. How many people are going to be in our parking lot tonight? More than they will handle. I'll tell you that. More than they will handle. But how do we take this to decide to make people disciples? Because we're disciples and we want to do that. I think we have to pray about that and think about it and get involved real big with it. You know, we've talked a lot about the food program. We try to get people's name in there and try to call people. You are special. We try to, we have to be careful when we say that because of the government and all that. But still, we talk about God and Christ. And but how do we get these people to come and listen and hear about God and become children of God? I'm not smart enough to know that answer. I think it takes a lot of prayer. I think it takes a lot of effort on everyone of our parts. And I think that we need to be conscious of the opportunity to talk about God. Don't be ashamed of it. God loves you. God loves each of them. And he wants us to do that. The author here said, discipling others. No one is a mature disciple of Jesus if he or she is not bringing others to Jesus. Jesus is to do what Jesus did. Jesus, each, each of us is to follow Jesus and do what Jesus did. Jesus made disciples. Follow Jesus, we have to make disciples also. So, as you go through this week, think about it. Purposes are good, but the mission of Christians is to disciple others. 
And Randy had an excellent example of his lesson today, how no matter what your age or anything, if you just pray about it, we can all find some way to help others. I appreciate how AJ has been calling on these people. Discipling others not only means to win new people for Christ, but it's helped to build up Christians that are already here. They cannot feel alone. Let them know that they're important to each of us that we do that. Remember, Jesus took 12 men and changed the world. He didn't do it, but big, big deals don't work. The Alpha program in Britain has had over 3 million people in their program teaching about Jesus. Church attendance in Britain has not gone up at all. Promise Keeper. It's a great program. It's a great program for you. Never that. But even the Promise Keepers executives say, we need to do more. We have to do better at following up with these programs to make them work. Program night. If we don't follow up with it, it's good, it's healthy, but it's not going to accomplish the job. We have to continually work to reach these people. And just like the mentoring, you have to get to know them person. This young man I took to dinner, to lunch. We met weekly, we prayed. I got to know him. To really be effective with people, we have to get to know other people. We can't just stay in our little cocoon for our friends and everything. We have to reach out. So as you go through this week, think about that. Think about your mission is to make disciples. We're going for some world. We're helping people look at pay. For 500 people were baptized last uh, year before I in Haiti. Guess what problem Haiti's had? Huh? COVID. <laughs> well, that's not the answer, Dale. We're talking about <laughs> with these conversions. They are having COVID problems. They don't have enough people to bring these people to the next level. Because, see, if you don't bring them forward, continue to grow, what happens to you? What happens to you if you just sit around and don't do anything for a few days? You get weak. Huh? You get weak. You don't accomplish it. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I did that all day yesterday. I, I had nothing. But if we don't get out, we get involved. If you want to help them, they're going to get weak too. Their chances of remaining a Christian are almost there. Their chances of becoming active in the church is very more remote if we don't get somebody to help. So, celebrate the fourth. It's one of my favorite times. We have a great country. A lot of people don't understand that right now. They don't appreciate it. But you and I were born in one of the best times a person could live. Look at all the good things that's happened as, during the period of time we've been alive. We need to be thankful for that. So, if I was to know you, make disciples. But the key word there is make help people become more disciples than they were before. And continue to work on yourself to become more disciples. See, we won't ever get to the point where we can stop growing. We need to continue to grow every day for the rest of our life. And there's always something you can do, regardless of your age. Send a card. Talk to somebody. Say a prayer. Let's say a prayer now. Almighty God, we're thankful for Jesus. 
We're thankful for the job that he did for over three years with these 12 men. We're thankful for his additional teaching, bringing them along, and we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that cut them loose for the church, Acts 2 church. 3,000 people received Christ in one day. Let us never forget the importance of this event. Having people come to Jesus, becoming citizens like him. As we go through this week, help us do something. Help us pray for a way to help somebody. Think about Jesus. But we know if they're not thinking about Jesus, they won't become a child of God. Thank you for our families. Thank you for this class, the love of sin. We are truly blessed. Forgive us our sin. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's all, folks.